minutes after. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening. My name is Malika Elias. I am a campaigner on Friends of the Earth's Emerging Technology Program, and I'll be what moderating our webinar today. And as we begin today's session, I'd like to introduce our partner, Trilse, who will orient us to how we'll be practicing language justice and interpretation in this evening's session. So I'm gonna pass it to you, Trilse. Thank you, Malika. Welcome folks, bienvenidos. If we could go to the next slide, please. We're going to be practicing language justice on this call. Um, the call is going to be held in English and Spanish. Vamos a estar practicando justicia del lenguaje en esta llamada o en este webinario. Eh, vamos a tener la llamada en español y en inglés. Um, language justice it includes the right that we all have to communicate in the language or languages in which we feel most powerful and articulate. La justicia del lenguaje es el derecho que tenemos todos a comunicar en el idioma o idiomas en los que nos sentimos más poderosos y articulados. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, para facilitar esto, vamos a tener interpretación en español e inglés. Eh, yo voy a estar interpretando y mi compañera Andreina también, eh, que ya está eh, interpretando ahora. Um, to facilitate the space, we're going to have interpretation. I will be interpreting. And Andreina, uh, my colleague who is um, interpreting right now, will also be interpreting. Um, please use the interpretation feature if you don't speak both Spanish and English. Um, speak slow at a slow enough pace that we're able to interpret, um, pausing naturally and breathing. So if you start to feel yourself getting out of breath, um, likely you're speaking too fast. <laughs> um, and speak one at a time. That's pretty easy on a um, webinar, but maybe for facilitators, remember to speak one at a time. Um, para facilitar esto, vamos a tener interpretación español-inglés. Eh, por favor, uh, entren al cuarto de interpretación en español para poder oír si es que no hablan inglés y también español, porque vamos a estar hablando ambos idiomas. Eh, por favor, hablen a un ritmo lento y hagan pausas. Eh, si están hablando muy rápido, Eh, por favor, hablen un poco más despacio para poder interpretar. Y por favor, recuerden una persona hablar a la vez. Um, next slide, please. Vamos a estar usando el módulo eh, de interpretación de Zoom. We're going to be using the Zoom interpretation feature. Y para habilitar esto, eh, pueden hacer clic en la palabra interpretación abajo, eh, que es un globo terráqueo en la parte inferior a la derecha de la pantalla. Eh, si están usando un teléfono, bueno, eso después lo digo, pero eh, elijan español. Um, so to, and to use interpretation, please click on the globe at the lower right of your screen and select English to hear interpretation. Um, next slide, please. Si se está uniendo a la llamada a través de un teléfono móvil, eh, hagan clic en la, los tres puntos que dicen más. Y después elijan interpretación de idiomas o language interpretation y después el idioma. If you are calling in through a cell phone, please click on the three dots at the bottom, then language interpretation and then English. And uh, next slide. Eh, como es un webinario, eh, vamos a pedir que usen eh, las reacciones eh, abajo para... Eh, demostrar que están de acuerdo con algo, que tienen alguna pregunta y también pueden comunicar con nosotros eh, vía el recuadro de chat. Eh, para acceder a eso pueden elegir chat abajo y después elegir todos los panelistas y, as y personas asistiendo y así su mensaje llegará a todos. Bueno, muchas gracias y cualquier, si están teniendo algún problema con la interpretación y no están pudiendo oír, por favor, eh, Envíenos un mensaje en el chat. Um, so we're, please use your chat um, to communicate with us um, and select all panelists and attendees when you click on the chat so that we can all get the message. If you're having any trouble with interpretation, please send us a message in the chat and we'll be sure to problem solve with you. Thank you very much. And uh, Malaika, if you could please put me, add me as an interpreter. 
I believe Dana will be doing that at this time. Are we good to go on interpretation? Great, okay. Okay, so moving on to the next slides. Um, thank you very much, Chilton and Jarena, again, for your support today. We couldn't do this without you. Um, I just have a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Um, as Chilton mentioned, everyone needs to click on that interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen and select either English or Spanish translation. Uh, we'll, we will be having part of the presentation presented to us in Spanish, so please make sure you're in the appropriate translation room unless you're bilingual. Um, we are recording speakers, but we're going to turn the recording uh, off for the discussion portion at the end of the webinar. We do encourage you to use the chat box often, and in addition to using the chat for interpretation questions, please um, do ask questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Our team will be monitoring the chat throughout the session and we'll be integrating audience questions into the Q&A session immediately following the speakers. And we'll do our best to translate comments into English and Spanish in the chat. And questions that are uh, raised in the Q&A will also be translated. Um, and I'd also just like to briefly introduce our panelists um, who are speaking today. First, we have J.D. Hansen, who is the policy director at the Center for Food Safety and is a leading expert on genetically engineered insects and animals. He has studied and reviewed U.S. and international oversight of genetically engineered moths, bullworms, olive flies, and mosquitoes for nearly 20 years. And then next we'll hear from Angel Garcia, who is the co-director of Californians for Pesticide Reform, where he fights to protect communities from harmful pesticides. And lastly, we have Jenny Loda, who is a staff attorney at the Center for Food Safety, where she works to challenge harmful industrial agriculture practices and technologies. And to set the um, context and provide some background information for you all, in March of 2022, the US EPA approved the release of up to 2 billion genetically engineered mosquitoes in California. Uh, if approved by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, British company Oxitec, um, who's responsible for creating these mosquitoes, may release billions of these uh, experimental mosquitoes across Tulare County. And these genetically engineered mosquitoes have not been properly studied and pose risks to people in the environment. Um, with that being said, I will now pass it off to JD Hansen to talk a bit more about what this mosquito is and some of the risks and concerns of this project. Well, this, uh... This mosquito's uh, generic name is the yellow fever mosquito. It's uh, uh, been in the uh, Americas uh, for uh, more than 100 years, but it's not been in, in California most of that time. Um, the, um, the mosquito can potentially carry a number of uh, viruses, uh, but in the in the U.S., uh, we don't have these um, uh, diseases now. So um, the the whole thing about uh, mosquito-borne diseases is uh, they only transmit a disease if they bite somebody uh, who has that disease. So if you don't have people with the disease, uh, even if you've got some of these mosquitoes around, they can't transmit a disease that you don't have. Um, so, so what is this uh, co British company uh, trying to do here? Um, well, mostly they're mostly they're trying to sell uh, billions of mosquitoes to the mosquito control districts. 
Um, why? Well, they have genetically engineered uh, the females of these mosquitoes. And remember, the females are the only ones that can bite and can transmit disease. They've genetically engineered the females to require an antibiotic to live, uh, which is strange because most of the time we're trying to keep antibiotics out of the environment so that we don't develop resistance to those antibiotics when we need them for human treatments. But these, um, these mosquitoes are genetically engineered um, to use an antibiotic called tetracycline. Um, now, Tulare is a particularly bad place uh, to be releasing these, these mosquitoes because the fruit trees around Tulare are being sprayed with, with tetracycline. The uh, dairies and the chicken uh, farms and other places where they're raising uh, uh, animals, they're being fed this tetracycline. So what you have is in the environment exactly what's supposed to be a kill switch for these mosquitoes to keep them from continuing to breed. Um, they can get this uh, tetracycline in the environment and they only need small doses. Um, so they're likely to be out in the wild breeding instead of disappearing. Um, the whole theory about this is they won't get the tetracycline, they'll die, and uh, you won't have any of these, these mosquitoes. So what are our concerns? One, it won't work. The, uh, the females will survive. Um, two, um, it's not necessary. Uh, uh, Rachel Carson, um, who wrote the book Silent Spring, in that book, she says, there are lots of ways to do sterile insects, but mosquitoes won't work because they can always blow in from somewhere else. So there are better solutions. And um, then if the mosquitoes, if the females live and they can breed with local mosquitoes, you end up with a hybrid mosquito that might be more virulent and will bite you more than what you got now. Um, so um, what, um, what we want to do, and I think we can go to the next, next slide. And I, uh, you know, uh, the same company, when they wanted to do olive uh, flies in Spain, the Spaniards said, you have to give us data publicly so that people can look at it. We want to know the health effects of it. We want to know the environmental effects of it. The EPA and this company have not given us that public data. So we're worried that this, this experiment uh, releasing 2 billion uh, mosquitoes, for goodness sakes, um, might create more environmental and public health problems than it's going to solve. Uh, next slide. Um, the, the other thing they, you know, the, the, we can tell from the data that's been uh, blacked out by the Environmental Protection Agency that the Environmental Protection Agency is worried about some of these things too. It's just they're not giving us the data. Um, these uh, mosquitoes um, can, can give you allergic reactions. And so we're worried about uh, 2 billion mosquitoes going out there and potentially being able to bite you and causing allergic reactions. And, uh, you know, and the worst of it is if the mosquitoes do persist in the environment, the EPA's solution 
is to spray them with pesticides we already know is bad. So um, these mosquitoes um, probably won't stop disease. They may survive themselves. They may give you an allergic reaction and they may cause uh, greater pesticide use. So I think I stopped there. Thank you, JD. And now we'll hear from Jenny Loda on some of the regulatory concerns and need for proper assessment of this proposed experiment. Jenny. Thanks, Monica. So in general, California has among the strongest environmental regulations in the United States. But unfortunately, in this instance, there are no state um, nor federal reg regulations that specifically cover insects or other animals whose genetics have been altered in the laboratory. So this proposal to release genetically engineered mosquitoes is being shoehorned into an existing process that is really meant for approving pesticides. Uh, and it's overseen by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. So automatically, you can see the problem with that because a live animal is much different to release into the environment than a pesticide. Um, and so what are some other problems is that the Department of Pesticide Regulation, because they're focused on pesticides, they don't have any um, scientists or other experts on staff who really know about genetically engineered insects. And could. So they don't have the right folks to properly um, assess uh, what's going on here. Um, also, the rules that this department is using here to decide whether to allow this um, mosquito experiment are very loosely defined. So it means the department has a lot of flexibility in what facts they considered and how they analyze information that's provided to them about this proposal. And all of the information about the mosquito that they're using to consider whether to allow the releases are coming from the company that makes the, this mosquito and will profit off of it if it's approved for use in California. And so this includes information such as whether releasing the mosquito is safe for humans and the environment, and whether it will actually do anything to help reduce the number of mosquitoes in your area, or if it could potentially cause problems like JD mentioned, such as breeding with other wild mosquitoes or transmitted diseases that are not currently found here. So right now it appears that the company that manufactures the mosquito is really hiding all of this important data about the mosquito's effects by calling it confidential business information. So even what they have come up with is not something that's available to us, the public, to review. In addition, because there has never been a genetically engineered insect or animal released in California, um, the way the decision is made about this GE mosquito release will likely set a precedent for future decisions um, about proposals to release other genetically engineered animals in the state. And we know that uh, companies like Oxitec and others are working on other genetically modified insects and other types of animals that they would like to uh, release into the environment. And so that's one reason we really wanna make sure that this is done properly here. Um, so California's regulations that are meant to protect your health and safety really only work if communities speak up and say what they do and don't want and why. So it's really important to say what you think about the mosquito um, whenever the state announces official opportunities for comment, whether it's meetings or in writing. And we'll talk a little bit more later in this webinar about how to do that. So uh, next slide. So what would be responsible regulations and assessments? What, what do we think that review process would look like? So the groups presenting this information today, we're really working to protect community residents and our shared natural environment by trying to uh, advocate and ask for the state to do a number of things as it considers this decision. First, we want them to recognize 
that the rules and processes are just really not in place yet to evaluate genetically engineered insects. So they really aren't ready to make this decision responsible, responsibly and release these insects into the environment that potentially we can't get back. Um, so, so some steps for responsible process would include uh, evaluating mosquito proposal, um, following um, all of the steps prescribed in California's other environmental regulations that are used for other types of proposals that affect public health and the environment. And the analysis of that proposal should be comprehensive and transparent and with all of that information being disclosed to the public. This analysis should also depend on information not only provided by the company that breeds the mosquitoes. Um, the, we want the Department of Public uh, Pesticide Regulation to disclose all of the data that's available related to this mosquito, as well as schedule more opportunities to inform uh, the community, the residents of the area where these mosquitoes are planned to be released and to allow opportunity for public input, including opportunities to testify at locations in the community with translators available. Also, the information disclosed about the mosquito should really include all of the public data or should include all of the data for public review from a field trial that has already been occurring for releases in Florida and review of data from releases of mosquitoes in other countries such as Brazil, Cayman Islands, and Panama. And right now, none of this is available to us because the company claims it as confidential business information. So there's no real way for us to properly evaluate whether it's effective, what um, potential harms it may have. So the second way the analysis should be comprehensive is it should and really involve more than just the Department of Pesticide Regulation. California has a number of state agencies whose responsibilities include um, considerations of effects on public health and natural resources and the environment. And so we want them to all be involved in this process as well, since um, there is no clear agency that's to just look at these types of releases. In addition, um, we think that the department should uh, form a group of independent scientists to be involved in the decision making who are specifically knowledgeable about genetically engineered animals and insects um, and come from all different relevant fields, um, such as ecologists and entomologists and public health uh, folks in the public health sector. Um, as well as other other key experts and stakeholders to make sure we really have an independent review um, of, of this proposal and ensure that you know, it's being considered in every way possible, uh, what types of outcomes it may have. And finally, if the department does decide to go ahead and approve these releases in California, we want them to have monitoring and oversight of the experiment um, by um, monitors that are state employees and independent monitors, um, not folks from the company that is doing the release itself, uh, which is what is currently proposed. So clearly it's a conflict of interest when you have the company who's releasing them and, and wants to have the data look good for them to do the monitoring themselves. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Angel will now take over to talk a little bit more about the lack of public participation in this process and how it impacts Tulare County community members. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, soy Angel García. Gracias por eh, tomarse el tiempo eh, en esta linda tarde para acompañarnos y tocar este tema muy importante. Eh, quisiera empezar con eh, mencionar que 
eh, pues el condado de Tulare tiene una población aproximadamente de 473,117 personas que viven en él. Y como muchos de ustedes eh, saben, eh, el condado de Tulare eh, primordialmente es un condado rural donde la a, agricultura predomina. Según unos estimados recientes, por ejemplo, por el Centro Nacional de Salud de Campesinos, se estima que alrededor de 48 mil residentes eh, en el condado de Tulare trabajan en la agricultura. También se estima que más del 66% de la población en el condado de Tulare eh, se, se le conoce como uh, latiné. Y también una de las cosas importantes cuando mencionamos el condado de Tulare es que existe un gran número de comunidades no incorporadas. Si nos basamos en el norte del condado, podemos mencionar Monsen. Um, Monsen, eh, se encuentra Sultana, se encuentra... Eh, este, y, y si nos vamos más para el, el medio, nos encontramos con Tulibio, eh, nos encontramos con uh, Poplar, y si vamos para el sur, nos encontramos con comunidades eh, pequeñas como Terrabela, entre otras, que muchas veces no tienen la infraestructura que se requiere para proveer servicios a los residentes. Y por esa razón, eh, ese nomás es para dar un, una, un, un sinopsis de lo que, lo que es el condado de Tular, ¿verdad? Que la de, demografía es, es, un, es un condado primordialmente campesino, donde hay mucha gente trabajadora que se la rifa todos los días. Es un condado caracterizado por eh, los múltiples idiomas que se hablan más allá del español eh, e inglés. También se hablan eh, idiomas eh, milenarias como el mixteco, eh, el zapoteco, eh, el purépecha, entre otros. Eh, y es una comunidad también que se caracteriza por ten, eh, atravesar muchos retos eh, y mucha injusticia ambiental. Por mencionar algunos, eh, no podemos hablar del contrato tulare sin hablar eh, sobre el problema del agua. ¿Cuántos de ustedes no saben o conocen o han escuchado? En las noticias sobre los pozos que están contaminados con nitratos o que estamos en una región consistentemente con de las peores calidades de aire en todo el país. Aparte de eso, no podemos eh, ignorar la, la, el, el gran uso de pesticidas en el condado de Tulare. Es por eso que, eh, de hecho, el condado de Tulare ha, eh, se encuentra consistentemente eh, en tercer lugar en cuanto a más pesticidas se usan, usan hasta más de 15 eh, millones de libras anualmente. Y eso es una cifra eh, que de, en definitiva eh, puede ser más. Entonces, eh, es un, a grandes rasgos, el condado de Tulare es un condado que sufre de mucha injusticia ambiental que atraviesa muchos retos económicos, sociales, eh, también retos de viviendas, y donde muchos de estos uh, temas ambientales eh, están muy concentrados. También es importante mencionar que en la región de Baiselia Porosville se encuentra en el, en el quinto lugar en cuanto a eh, viviendas sin mucho acceso al Internet. Entonces, a grandes rasgos, el condado cadece de muchos eh, servicios, de muchas protecciones y atraviesa por muchos retos, tanto sociales como ambientales. Eh, siguiente um, um, imagen, por favor. El next slide. Okay. Eh, entonces, eh, ahorita lo que ha pasado es lo siguiente. Um, no ha habido una participación adecuada 
muy poca información se ha dado al público. De hecho, para algunos de ustedes que quizás ha, han visto en ciertas partes, um, se, han, se han visto anuncios en algunas redes sociales sobre Oxitec y el mosquito, edad que eh, supuestamente va a ayudar a, 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 a dirigir a estos problemas de eh, los que mencionó el colega uh, JD, um, edad, el dengue, la chingonguña, entre otros. Pero la cosa es que, como mencionaron los colegas anteriores, no se sabe mucho de los estudios ni de los datos que se han encontrado eh, cuando se ha liberado eh, millones de estos mosquitos en la comunidad. ¿verdad? Entonces, la participación de parte de ellos para que el público pueda uh, hacer, eh, enterarse más sobre el tema no ha estado allí. De hecho, eh, la participación hasta ahorita ha sido muy pobre. La participación pública no ha sido muy accesible para la comunidad. Por ejemplo, cuando se eh, hubo un comentario un periodo de comentario público en abril del año pasado que solamente era de 15 días. Y sin ningún... Y, 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 y esto eh, no es tiempo suficiente para que la comunidad primero se entere de que hay... de que tal mosquito se, se planea liberar en el ambiente eh, o en el condado de Tulare. No da tiempo suficiente para que la gente pueda eh, participar la información muchas veces no está accesible. Mucha de esta información se circuló solamente en inglés. Y pues el alcance para que la gente y la comunidad esté informada no estuvo allí. Entonces, imagínense, 15 días para uno hacer uh, algún comentario o sugerencia sobre este tema. Pero ahora imagínense, si no se puede, eh, si no se sabe de esto, eh, y, y, y ya se perdió esa oportunidad. Entonces, uno de los grandes retos o de las preocupaciones que eh, eh, existen ahorita es que la participación pública no ha sido accesible para la comunidad. Entonces, lo que se está pidiendo es que el Departamento de Regulación de Pesticidas haga un proceso que sea más transparente, que sea un proceso más democrático que sea un proceso que pueda alcanzar a las comunidades, ¿verdad? Entonces, eso va a ser importante en hacer de aquí en adelante. Y es importante que los que están aquí en esta tarde, por favor, corran la voz. Corran la voz con sus vecinos, corran la voz con sus conocidos, corran la voz eh, con los familiares, con, con, con su red de, 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 de amistades. Porque esto... Básicamente lo que está indicando es que quieren experimentar con la comunidad. Eh, next slide, please. Y por último, esto es hasta cierto punto una violación del derecho. O sea, ¿en qué momento la comunidad dijo vengan aquí al condado de Tulare a que vayan a experimentar aquí cerca de nuestras comunidades, cerca de nuestras familias, cerca de nuestros, es, nuestros estudiantes, de nuestras escuelas. ¿En qué momento? Nunca se consultó y es por eso que más que nada, que más que, más que nunca necesitamos se, participar e informarnos acerca de qué podemos hacer para asegurar de que la, los datos indiquen claramente que esto no nos va a afectar, porque imagínense, como dijeron los colegas, se planea liberar dos billones de mosquitos. Son bastantes. ¿Y quién nos asegura que no va a haber consecuencias a largo plazo? ¿Quién nos asegura de que eh, estos mosquitos no vayan a afectarnos el día de mañana? ¿Edad? Así que imagínense qué va a pasar. Esta compañía eh, es una compañía de afuera que quiere venir aquí y quiere uh, liberar los mosquitos. La comunidad no es un experimento. La comunidad tiene el derecho de decir no hacer experimentos de estos mosquitos transgénicos. 
Y nosotros tenemos el derecho a que nuestras comunidades y nuestros vecindarios estén libres de ser experimentos. Es por eso que eh, en esta tarde queremos traer conciencia sobre este tema, que es un tema muy importante porque la gente tiene el derecho de saber y, eh, e informarse acerca de algo tan importante. Tenemos el derecho de decidir por, nos, por nosotros mismos de, de, de recibir esta información por completo y no recibir información a medias o recibir información de lo que esta compañía llamada Oxitec solamente quiere soltar de poco a poco o soltar información que les convenga. Entonces, a grandes rasgos, esto lo de eh, Oxitec eh, es una, eh, también es un tema de, 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 de confianza, de, de no eh, dar nuestro derecho para ser consultados, de no ser transparentes con nosotros. Entonces, eh, en esta tarde, pues, eh, de nuevo queremos invitarles a que se conecten con esto, que se informen más y que también, por favor, corran la voz. Corran la voz porque ustedes no son experimentos. Eh, y con eso, pues, este concluyo eh, esta parte. Thank you, Angel. Okay, so we are approaching the end of our webinar. And before we jump into the discussion portion at the end, um, just want to go through some action items and resources that are available to you all, starting with this action alert on our website at nogemosquitoes.org. Um, and we'll send all this information in a follow-up email to, pan to participants, so don't worry if you aren't able to write everything down. Um, the letter that you all see here urges the Department of Pesticide Regulation to say no to Oxitex mosquito experiment. And one way to take action is signing on to this letter and sharing it with your community. Um, we really need government structures and regulations and sound science and a democratic process like everyone had mentioned before me. Uh, and together we can ensure that people don't become scientific experiments and that we're moving from a place of true sustainability, which is needed at this time. And that's not what this project um, proposes. So please do sign on to this petition and help spread the word. Also on our website, we have a variety of um, fact sheets. Some of them are short, long. Uh, we have issue briefs and we have reports with more information about the proposed release of these genetically engineered mosquitoes in case you all wanna read more um, or share with your networks and share on social media. This uh, image here is just another example of things that are in our social media toolkit that you can share along with the language and hashtags that we have in that toolkit as well. Um, and all of that again will be shared with you all after the presentation. And another thing I just wanted to highlight um, lastly is this brief informational video on the proposed release and it's available in Spanish and English and also has uh, English and Spanish subtitles to accompany each video which you can also share um, on social media and amongst your community and networks. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, if you have any in-depth questions or comments you'd like to share, please feel free to email any of the panelists. All of our email addresses are listed here for you, and they'll also be shared out in a follow-up email um, either tomorrow or Monday. Um, so I think we need to stop recording now and move into our discussion section. So Dana, if you could stop recording, that would be